Okay, chapter 14 is our anatomy and physiology chapter. It's about residents and the aging process. So we need to know what is normal for aging so we know what the abnormal things are that you're going to need to report immediately or stat to the nurse. General characteristic of aging, the body is made of different systems that all work together to make up our body functioning. Reduced functioning of the body systems does happen naturally, it does happen gradually, and it happens to everyone, but not everyone who is old is feeble and not able to take care of themselves. People age gracefully, they age naturally, it is eventually going to happen, but it happens to people at different stages depending on their genetics, depending on their lifestyle choices, and depending on if they have any kind of chronic illnesses or problems that are weighing them down. But ultimately, aging is inevitable. But as we age, it doesn't mean that we're all going to get dementia or be senile. The body and its systems change naturally as this normal part of aging. And because this happens, it could be, it's going to happen to everyone, but it could be considered normal. Okay, Everybody is an individual person. They are not labeled by what kind of health condition they have. So make sure that you're not just looking at people and saying that they're old and thinking that they don't think clearly or they have no feelings. So don't ever confuse poor health or um, confusion with aging. There are plenty of 100-year-old people who are completely fine, still driving themselves around, living at home independently. The difference between acute and chronic problems. An acute problem is a problem that begins rapidly, typically lasts for about 7 to 10 days, and then the person's going to recover. So usually if you have a cold or the pneumonia or some stomach flu or gastritis, you're not sick forever, you're just acutely ill for about 7 to 10 days and then you're better. If you have a chronic illness, this is going to last over a long period of time. There are waxing and waning of the symptoms, sometimes you feel well, sometimes it's worse. It can occur or reoccur often. Sometimes people live with constant pain from chronic illnesses like chronic back pain or arthritis, but it doesn't mean they have to suffer in pain every day. If someone with arthritis tells you that they're in pain, you let the nurse know so that we can give them some pain medicine. You don't just say, oh, well, what do you expect? You have arthritis. Okay. Observing and reporting, you must be able to recognize what is normal in order to tell us what is abnormal in bodily functioning. So, a sign is a body characteristic that can be observed objectively. This means it's something that you can see. You can see a rash, you can see bruising, you can see illness or redness. So, those kind of signs are things that you're definitely going to report as abnormal. And then symptoms are more subjective. They're things that the patient reports to you, something that they're feeling. It may not be observable to you. They could say they're in pain. If they're grimacing, then yes, it would be a sign that they're in pain. But if they're not grimacing or making a, a crunched up face when you touch them or don't look like they're crying and they tell you they're in pain with a 10 out of 10, we just have to believe that they are in pain because that is their symptom. Nausea is a symptom. We can't see nausea, that's a symptom, but we can see vomiting, which would be a sign. Um, if they feel like they're itching, you can't see the itching, but you can see the rash. So there's a difference between a sign and a symptom, but both of them are reportable to the nurse. A clue is a hint that something might be going on. So again, if your patient is frowning when you move them, if they hold onto the chest when they cough, if they're taking frequent trips to the bathroom. All of those are clues that maybe something is not going right. You need to be observant for clues and signs and then ask the patients about their symptoms. You may notice these clues and signs before anyone else because you know the resident's routines, you know how they usually are, you're going to be able to let us know if they're acting differently or if they're giving you clues or signs that something is going on. The body's response to infection happens in different ways. A localized infection, you can see an infected cut or cellulitis, which is swelling and redness of the skin and tissue. It's localized to one area. If you had a rash on your hand or a cut on your hand and it started to swell, 
and have pus coming out with the red, the white blood cells. Whole body infection is if it's an internal infection. Your whole body is affected by the flu or pneumonia. You have a cough. You have a fever. You can have signs and symptoms of this virus, of this infection that has taken over your whole body. We also have a silent infection. So people who are infected with HIV, it is a virus. We may not be able to see this HIV virus, but we, the patient will have some signs or symptoms like fatigue, um, yellowing of their skin due to organ failure, different things that we can possibly see, but it's usually silent. It's going on in the background all the time, not always necessarily causing a direct problem. Your cancer is also sometimes a silent infection. Uh, cancer warning signs. You can see a lump in the breast or any other part of the body. With men who get testicular cancer, they may have a little mass in their testicles. Um, with women with breast cancer, a movable mass is usually not as worrisome as a hard asymmetrical mass that's not moving very much. If we have a sore that does not heal, if you have a nagging cough, if you have any unusual bleeding or discharge, um, especially women after menopause should really not be bleeding down there anymore during a regular cycle. But if they have some unusual bleeding, sometimes it could be a sign of uterine cancer or ovarian cancer or something that needs to be checked out. Um, discharge from any part of your body, for example, the nipples, the penis, anything where discharge is coming out, it could be a cancer warning sign. Changes in your bowel or bladder habits. Some people get more constipated when they have rectal cancer, colorectal cancer. Some people um, have constant diarrhea when they have gastrointestinal cancers. So there's different kinds of warning signs with just change in bowel or bladder habits, changing in the consistency, the color, the size, the shape of your stool. So stool is the same thing as um, your bowel movement. It's called bowel movement or stool. You can be, have diarrhea where it's very watery, or you can have constipation where you're blocked up or it's very hard and solid like little pebbles. Okay, so know that when people are having a stool, it's called defecation, and that's what stooling or having a bowel movement is called. Your integumentary system. So we're going to start with the different systems, the body systems, and go through what is normal and some common abnormal things that go on with people. Your integumentary system is your skin. The function of your skin is to protect your body. Your epithelial tissue covers the body and lines the body cavities. These epithelial tissues prevent germs in the environment from entering the body. Just like we talked about in the infection control chapter, um, the skin also helps us to regulate our body temperature by sweating. The reason that you sweat is because when the sweat is on your skin, it evaporates and cools you down. So if you have a fever, you start sweating, and then that evaporation is going to try to help lower your internal body temperature. But all of that is regulated through your skin. There are three layers of skin. The three layers of skin start with the epidermis, or the top layer. That's what you can see and what you can feel. As we age, sometimes that epidermis layer gets dry, there's lack of oil, there's lack of hair. We need to just keep it a little bit more moisturized for people. That epidermis layer is also very thin and it tears or shears very easily. Your dermis is a thicker layer underneath the epidermis. That's where we're going to have your oil glands, your sweat glands, the roots of your hair, your blood vessels. So if you get a paper cut, it goes down to that second layer of skin and you can feel the little nerve endings and it may feel a little bit more painful than if you just scratch the top of your epidermis. The third layer of skin is your subcutaneous tissue. Your subcutaneous tissue is a cushion of fat underneath the dermis that helps the skin get its smooth appearance or smooth look. It also helps to retain heat in the body because it's your fat layer. So the reason that elderly people are sometimes a lot more cold all the time is because their body is not able to retain its heat as it was when you were younger. In this uh, subcutaneous layer of skin is where we have extensions or outgrowths from your hair, from your fingernails. 
some mucous membranes that line the nose, the mouth, and other openings in your body. This is just layers about the of layers the skin. of the skin. The skin consists of three layers of specialized tissue. The outermost layer is the epidermis. The next layer is the dermis that is composed of blood and lymph vessels, nerve fibers, and the accessory organs of the skin. The third layer is subcutaneous tissue. This is connective tissue that specializes in forming fat. So your subcutaneous tissue, as we age, you have less of that, which makes your skin a little bit more thin and a little bit more wrinkly because that third layer is thin. The integumentary system includes the skin and its associated structures. As a person ages, his or her skin becomes more susceptible to bruising and skin tears. As a nursing assistant, you will need to monitor the resident's skin condition constantly. Consider this scenario. One day, when checking the resident's vital signs, you find that she has a rash on her upper arm. Integumentary system problems, like a rash, can give us some insight into other problems. The rash developing on the resident may be the result of irritation from soap or lotion, or it may be the result of a more serious allergic reaction. In either case, the nurse should be notified so the rash may be treated and its cause investigated. Other integumentary system signs and symptoms may include Redness. Keep in mind that it's natural for some redness to occur when pressure is exerted. However, the redness should disappear when the pressure is relieved. Pressure sores or ulcers that appear on the skin in areas where skin is close to an underlying bone. Irritation, numbness, burning, tingling, itching, and bruising. Bruising will show up as a darker colored area on dark or yellow skinned residents. Swelling or lumps, area of skin breakdown, and drainage or a foul odor coming from the skin. Residents who are dehydrated may experience poor skin turgor, which may be indicated by tenting of skin. Dry skin that tents when you gently pinch it is a sign of dehydration. This is referred to as poor skin turgor and indicates a lack of fluid in the subcutaneous tissues. In the elderly, the most accurate areas to check skin turgor are the back of the hand, the forehead, and skin over the sternum or breastbone. Sunken dark appearance around the eyes is another sign of dehydration. Okay, so our skin can give us very good clues about things that could be going wrong. But as we age, these are things that naturally happen. There is a decrease in the oil production, which gives us a little bit drier hair, drier skin. There's a thinning of the underlying dermis layer, which gives us wrinkling of the skin. There's a decrease in the elasticity of your skin, which is going to make your skin sag some a shrinkage of your subcutaneous level, level layer of skin, which is going to help di make difficult for adjusting to heat loss, especially on your face and on the back of your hands, and then a decrease in the melanin in your hair bulbs, and this is the reason that people get graying hair. Melanin is the coloring that's in your hair, and it eventually goes away as we age, and we're all going to eventually get gray hair. Um, decreased rate of growth of hair follicles means a lot of times there's some thinning in people's hair. Some abnormal symptoms you're going to report, just like the video said, any bleeding, any rashes. As far as the rashes, remember with contact isolation, if it's a rash, you do not want to touch it with your hands. It may just be a contact rash or an allergic reaction that the person is having but it may also be something caused by a fungus or by scabies. So those are all things that you don't want to touch with your bare hands. You want to make sure you put gloves on. People get rashes most of the time from contact dermatitis if we leave too much soap on their skin or irritants or perfumed things or just having the bed sheets washed in different soaps or things that they're not used to. So rashes are important to report 
and to look at, um, especially if the resident's itching them or if they're getting opened up and bleeding from all of the itching. The cuts or bruises, anytime you have a cut or bruise on someone. Uh, this is a picture of a decubitus ulcer. So a decubitus ulcer or a pressure ulcer mean the same thing. This one happens to have a, a, a gauze inside here. This black portion is gauze and it's attached to a suction where it's coming out to a drainage. But around here, we have a clear piece of tegroderm that's making a tight seal. They call this a wound vac. So if you have a patient that has a wound vac on, it's your responsibility to make sure that all of this clear tegroderm stuck to their skin stays intact and is actually sticking, making an airtight seal around this gauze sponge here. And the wound vac is sucking out the drainage from this decubitus ulcer pressure sore. Decubitus ulcers have gone through all three layers of skin. Now they're into the muscle and into the tissues, into the bones, all the way down through all three layers of skin and they open up. Uh, we also have dry skin, the contact dermatitis. So skin is very important to keep up with. Your musculoskeletal system. This is the second layer, our second system we're going to talk about. The function of the muscular skeletal system is helping giving your body its shape. It helps enable you to move. Movement is important for you to get around and be active. Like we talked about in the moving and positioning chapter, people have to move to stay healthy, to stay well, to keep from getting contractures or shortening of their muscles. They need to be moving, extending, um, flexing all of these muscles and joints for comfort. Uh, you don't have to know all the different bones in the body, all the different muscles in the body. Just know that whatever you can move your hands, your arms, your shoulders, you need to do range of motion on your patients at least once you shift to make sure they're moving everything. Move their fingers, move their joints, move their toes. Tell them the they can do active range of motion. And we do a lot of that in the morning time with morning exercises. They sit in a circle and you do chair yoga together. If they can't do them by themselves, you're going to do passive range of motion where you're actually moving the joints for them through all of the range of motion of the joints to keep them to have less pain, to be more active. Uh, people with rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis, they may be really sore and can't move first thing in the morning, but the more they move around and get around, the less pain that they're in. The musculoskeletal system works to accommodate movement and protects internal organs from injury. As we age, we experience a decrease in strength, muscle tone, and muscle mass. Bones become more brittle and are more easily broken. Injuries to the musculoskeletal system may be apparent or they may be less than obvious. Some signs and symptoms of musculoskeletal injury include pain, obvious deformity, and swelling, typically at the site of injury. The inability to move arms, legs, or joints. Limited range of motion. Pain upon movement. Jerky or shaky movements. Weakness. Sensory changes and changes in the ability to sit, stand, move, or walk, shortening and external or outward rotation of one leg, new onset of the inability to bear weight on one or both legs, and new onset of the inability to use hands or arms. Any injury related to the musculoskeletal system should be reported to the nurse immediately. Do not attempt to move or manipulate the injured area. So, if you see any swelling or redness or obvious deformity, if you go into a room and a patient's laying on the floor, we talked about not getting them up off the floor by yourself. You have to wait for the nurse to come in, do an assessment to make sure we're not putting any weight on a broken hip or a broken bone. Your muscular skeletal system, your bones are important. They provide the framework for your body, but as we age, those bones get brittle. Brittle means that they're just more easily broken. So if you think about cooking a cookie, if you cook it too long in the oven, it just bakes and bakes and bakes and then 
it's brittle, it's just going to fall apart. It's not soft and gooey and chewy and flexible anymore. Okay. Muscles allow your body to move, but if you don't use your muscles, you lose them. And as we get older, you do lose muscle mass naturally. People use, um, don't do as much weight-bearing exercises, aren't really using the muscles like you used to when you were younger. And as you, they just waste away, or we talked about muscle atrophy in another chapter. Your tendons are what attach your muscles to your bones. So a lot of times when you twist an ankle or sprain an ankle, you've usually just torn a tendon or um, ruptured a tendon or a ligament. Those ligaments attach the bones to other bones. So if you just have a sprain, it's either a tendon or a ligament that's happened. It's not an actual broken bone, but it could still swell and be very painful and hard for you to move. Um, your joints are where two or mo more bones come together. As we age, the spinal column is a bone and it does shorten because um, it just there's less fluid, there's less mobility, you just start shrinking down, so there is a loss of height with some people. That's why it's important when we're doing admissions. You can't just ask them how much or how tall they are. You actually have to measure how tall they are on admission. Loss of minerals from your bones increases the risk of breakage. This is why we have the brittle bones. They're not absorbing their calcium, their magnesium as much anymore. And then that loss of that mineral, the phosphorus and things, just makes it more brittle, more increased risk of breakage. That's why when elderly people fall, a lot of times they do break a bone or fracture something and have to go in to be seen about. Loss of muscle mass equals a loss of strength, the loss of balance, the loss of, um, loss of elasticity of your muscles, give you some muscle stiffness. Your abnormal signs that you're going to have to report any swollen or reddened joints. Some people have nodules on their joints because of rheumatoid or osteoarthritis. They, they're normal, as long as they are not swollen and red and warm to the touch and painful. Bumps and bruises on the arms and legs. Again, we talked about when you are doing an incident report. If you just bump up against something, you may not bruise right away, but maybe ne the next day they're going to be black and blue and we need to know why, what they hit, what they ran into. They bumped against the leg of the wheelchair. They wheeled themselves into the door frame. So anytime that happens, just write a little incident report. If your resident is complaining of stiffness or an inability to move or any kind of pain, you have to report that to the nurse immediately. This is an example of what those arthritis, osteoarthritis, bones, and rheumatoid arthritis um, joints look like. Right now, those look normal because they're normal color of the skin. They may be a little deformed, but they're not reddened or swollen. If they are painful, red, swollen, and hot is when you're going to report them. Another common illness is your osteoporosis. So this is the brittle bone. Gradual loss of your minerals, especially the calcium. It is most common in postmenopausal women. Women usually need to start taking some calcium supplements after they go through menopause. It's usually not diagnosed until a resident is injured. When patients get to be 65, they take them for DEXA scans or bone density scans to see if they're losing the density of their bone and that makes them at higher risk for fractures or things like that and broken bones. We talked about fractures and um, hip fractures being the leading cause of injury in the elderly when we're doing the movement chapter. Another common illness is your contractures, the abnormal shortening of the muscles. We've seen a lot of those already. We're just kind of pulling inwards because the muscles are shortening and your body is contracting. Your foot drop is the inability or difficulty to move the ankles and toes upward into dorsiflexion. This is caused by some nerve damage or not being able to move those muscles. And then when you lay in the bed, the feet fall forward and you can't put them back into dorsiflexion where you'll be able to walk. Sometimes patients have neurological damage that happens with a muscle or spine trauma and abnormality in their anatomy or some toxins or diseases like strokes that cause them to have foot drop where it's going to make it very difficult for them to walk. All right, next system is your respiratory system. Everybody has to breathe. To me, this is the most important system. And if you ask my son, I always tell him, are you still breathing? 
you're fine. But when people have difficulty breathing, it's a medical emergency because you can die from not being able to breathe. Even if it's from asthma or from allergies, any a, a foreign airway obstruction, like when we learned the Heimlich maneuver, if you stop breathing or have difficulty breathing, it's a medical emergency. You need to make sure you're sitting the patient up, repositioning them, getting them sitting up in a chair or leaning over a desk to try to get them to increase the amount of oxygen. They can breathe better when they're sitting up as opposed to laying flat or supine in their bed. Some patients won't even let you put their bed completely supine because if they're laying flat on their back, they can't breathe. They're having dyspnea, shortness of breath. The function for respiratory system takes in oxygen through your nose or mouth as we breathe in and inhale, passes it through your trachea, which is your windpipe. Usually when people are choking, they have something stuck in their trachea. And they tell you, oh, it went down the wrong pipe, went down the wrong tube, because it went down their trachea instead of down their esophagus. Out from the trachea, it looks like a tree branching out into your lungs. It goes down your bronchi into little bronchioles like limbs, and then finally into the alveoli, which are at the ends of the trunk of the tree inside your lungs where the oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide. So the alveoli is where the oxygen is actually exchanged. When people have lung diseases like COPD or emphysema or asthma, they have a constriction in their lungs. They have those alveoli that are damaged and are not exchanging oxygen like they should. The heart and the lungs work together to help oxygenate our blood. The respiratory system moves air through the nose, pharynx, larynx, trachea, and bronchus to the alveoli where the gas exchange between oxygen and carbon dioxide occurs. Nares are the openings to the nose. The nasal cavity is lined with cilia, mucous membranes, and blood capillaries. The air is filtered by cilia, moistened by mucous membranes, and warmed by the blood. Air moves into the pharynx or throat, a common passageway for food and air. Air continues on to the larynx. The epiglottis, a flap of tissue in front of the larynx, closes off the larynx when swallowed to prevent food from entering. The larynx or voice box contains the vocal folds. The trachea or windpipe connects the larynx to the bronchial tree. The cartilage rings of the trachea prevent the trachea from collapsing. Lungs are spongy tissue with alveoli and blood capillaries. Breathing occurs because of the expansion and contraction of the lungs. The bronchi carrying the air subdivide into smaller branches called bronchioles. At the end of each bronchial are the alveolar sacs. The alveolar sacs are surrounded by blood capillaries and contain millions of single layer alveoli cells where the gas exchange takes place. Oxygenated air goes from the nose to the pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchus, and alveoli. By the process of diffusion, oxygen in the air moves from the alveoli to the capillaries. Carbon dioxide moves from the capillaries to the alveoli and is exhaled. This process is called respiration. Okay, so for respiration to happen, we have to inhale and exhale. We talked about that in the vital sign chapter where we're counting one respiration as one inhalation and exhalation. So the chest rises and falls and that is one respiration. Respiratory safeguards. The soft palate is visible at the back of the mouth and the epiglottis is too far down in the throat to view from here. As air enters through the nose, the soft palate is relaxed in a downward position to allow the air to pass. The epiglottis is open to allow the air to flow into the trachea, which is located in the anterior portion of the neck. From here, it can move safely on into the lungs. So there are certain respiratory disorders that we need to report. Um, and if you see any abnormalities in people having dyspnea or shortness of breath or difficulty breathing or painful breathing, then you need to let them know. Respiratory disorders may be life-threatening 
and may occur without warning. You should take care to note any of the following signs or symptoms and report them to the nurse immediately. Respiratory rate below 12 or above 20. Irregular respirations. Shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. Gasping, wheezing, severe coughing or retractions. Noisy, labored or irregular respirations. Or cyanosis indicated by lips, mucous membranes, or nail beds that appear blue. Okay, so the word cyanosis, cyan means blue. If you see anybody having any blueness in their lips or paleness in their lips or fingernails, let us know immediately. Okay. We talked about oxygen saturation. We talked about the oxygen tanks, making sure that the tanks have oxygen in them. Um, people have an oxygen concentrator and then a humidifier bottle that's filled with water to help humidify that the air so that it's easier for them. It doesn't dry their nose out. If you're transporting somebody with an oxygen tank, it needs to be in a wheeled holder. And even if you're transporting empty tanks, don't just carry the empty tank. It has to be in something wheeled or secured that you can push around. Your oxygen saturation is done on your pulse ox machine. If you have a pulse ox and you have someone with painted fingernails, it may not read through the paint on the fingernails. It's measuring the oxygen saturation in the capillary beds of your fingernail. So if you may need to remove the nail polish, if you can't remove the nail polish, try to get it on their toe. If you can't do that, you try to get it on their earlobe. They also have some new ones you can do on their forehead now. But breathing, respirations, exchange of carbon dioxide for oxygen in the lungs. It is one of the most important bodily functions. As we age, the chest wall and the lung structures do become a little bit more rigid, so there's not as much room for air, which can make it a little bit difficult to take deep breaths. After surgery, people don't want to take deep breaths as well. There is a decrease in the amount of air that can be exchanged, but that means that people may be breathing a little bit faster. They may be having some dyspnea on exertion, which is uh, rapid or painful breathing. If you see someone's nares that are flaring, so normal nostrils are normal, but when they're breathing and their nose is flaring in and out as they're breathing, that's a sign of dyspnea or difficulty breathing. Other abnormal signs you're reporting right away is your cyanosis or the bluish color around your lips, the nail beds, or your mucous membranes. And then any gasping for breaths or labored breathing, if you see their chest pulling in and out with accessory muscles as they're trying to breathe. If they complain of painful breathing, if they tell you it's just so hard to breathe, I just can't, can't breathe, that is a medical emergency that needs to be reported immediately. If they have shortness of breath, raise the head of their bed, use the pillows to elevate them. Sometimes it's easier for them to lean up over top of the table on some pillows so that they can open their airways, open their lungs up and breathe. An incentive spirometer is a little plastic machine that we give them after surgery to encourage them to breathe in and take a deep breath to open up their lungs and their diaphragm. So sometimes the respiratory therapists will have them do these incentive spirometer um, exercises. They leave this little spirometer at their bedside. You can encourage them to use it. They're not blowing into it. They are putting it in their mouth and sucking in and inhaling air to expand their lung volumes. Common illnesses. So this on an x-ray, the white infiltrates right here mean that that is filled with something solid, maybe an infection, maybe some fluid, maybe some, uh, some food, some kind of foreign object is actually in the lungs. The lungs are made of spongy material, but they should appear black on an x-ray, which means they're filled with air. If they appear white, that means there's something in them. Usually it's a pneumonia or something they've aspirated. Aspirated means breathing it into your lungs. Someone who's having a seizure and they vomit, they breathe it into their lungs, they've aspirated vomitus into their lungs. It's going to cause their lungs not to be able to exchange air appropriately. Cold and flus, really common in elderly people. They are susceptible hosts. 
We talked about breaking the chain of infection as a susceptible host. The best way to break the chain of infection is to get an immunization. Every year, annual flu vaccine. Every five years, or after 65, um, most people get a, a pneumonia vaccine that they just need to get after they're 65. Okay. Your pneumonia symptoms, difficulty breathing, cough, increased sputum. Sputum is actually the thick mucus that's coming up and coming out of their lungs. It's not just spit that's bubbling up in their mouth. You'll, you'll see what sputum is thick, mucusy, usually discolored stuff that they can hack up out of their lungs, especially when they wake up early in the morning or after they've been sleeping for a while. They're going to have shortness of breath. They're going to complain of painful breathing. They could possibly have a temperature or a fever. And then they could be tired or weak or lethargic. So lethargy, fatigue, is all the same as being tired. We need to help promote rest for them. We do want them to take some deep breathing exercises to try to cough up as much of the mucus as they can, but we also try to relieve their symptoms. It hurts when you cough too much. We give them some medicines to help loosen the mucus so they can cough it up and get it out. Encouraging good nutrition, encouraging good fluid intake to keep it all moist, to get it all out encouraging their movement, and then reminding them to do their deep breathing. Common illnesses and diseases that happen to some people as we age is going to be COPD. You'll hear people all the time, especially ex-smokers, tell you they have COPD. It just means chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It can be triggered by smoking. It can also be triggered by secondhand smoke. So anybody can get COPD even if they weren't a smoker. It's a chronic bronchitis along with a chronic emphysema. So lung damage is the inflammation to their large airways that become narrowed with increased mucus and their alveoli become enlarged and trap the air that can't be exhaled. So people with COPD sometimes need oxygen supplementation. But like we said, you're not supposed to be messing with the flow rate of the oxygen. The flow rate is determined by the nurse or the doctor's order. The nurse sets the flow rate because every person has a different flow rate for the amount of oxygen that they need. If we give the COPD emphysema patient too much oxygen, it can be harmful for them. So just because someone's pulse ox is dropping below 95, you don't crank up their oxygen to four or five liters without a doctor's order. And as a CNA, you don't mess with the flow rate of their oxygen anyhow. The nurse is the one that needs to call the doctor and determine what that flow rate of oxygen is. So oxygen is considered a medication. It needs to be ordered by the physician and the flow rate of it is also ordered by the physician. Sometimes people with COPD have this common sign that we call barrel chest. You can see that their chest is starting to look like a barrel. Instead of being flat, they start bulging out at the front because of their strenuous activities to breathe and using all these accessory muscles with their lungs continuously. Okay. So this is just another example of what the alveoli look like when they're damaged. Um, normal alveoli have the bronchioles and then these sacs that exchange air. And then your damaged ones are enlarged or have lots of air space in them where they trap air inside their lungs that they can't get out or can't escape. You're um, requiring a mask, requiring your oxygen. The nasal cannula is by far the most common, and then sometimes they need to wear a mask. This is your oxygen concentrator. This is your oxygen tank with the gauge on it here. And some people wear CPAPs or BiPAP machines at night when they're sleeping. Other residents have tracheostomies where they're not even breathing through their nose or their mouth. They have the trach right in the neck, and it's bypassing the, nas the nares in the mouth and it's just they're breathing straight through the tracheostomy in their neck. If you need to take care of a tracheostomy patient, you will be trained how to do that. You have to get checked off by the nurse to help people with the tracheostomies. This is another example of the incinispirometer. So we're using inhalers. This one has where we put medication inside the inhaler. It looks like a little piece pipe 
They put the breathing part in their mouth. They smoke on it for 15 minutes to inhale some medication, which is their jet nebulizers. They also have some little handheld handheld medications like the albuterol that we talked about in the first aid where they carry it around with them. They take two puffs of their albuterol inhaler whenever they're having an asthma attack. The incentivometers have different volumes that we set at for their volume of lung expansion. And again, they are breathing in, sucking in to make this dial rise up as they're opening up their lungs. And this inhaler here is the one that they carry with them. It's just attached to a little spacer. It makes it easier. You push it into the spacer and then they breathe it in when they are ready. Okay. The next system is your circulatory system or your cardiac system, your heart. Function of that is to carry oxygen from the lungs to the, the rest of your body. So we also carry waste products from your body back out to your kidneys or liver to get filtered to get out of the body. The biggest part of your circulatory system are your red blood cells. So these are called erythrocytes. They contain hemoglobin that carries the oxygen to the cells of the body. In the infection control chapter, we talked about your white blood cells or your leukocytes. Those were the ones that were going to come and invade when you had infection. But for the circulatory system, as far as carrying oxygen, those are your erythrocytes or your red blood cells. The red blood cells travel in veins and arteries and go to all parts of your body. When they are in your veins, they are deoxygenated. They used up all the oxygen. They're on their way back to the lungs to get more oxygen. When they're in your arteries, they're oxygenated. They're pumping from your heart to the vital parts of your body, the different cells of your body, to get that oxygen and let it exchange. It's important that you're able to recognize signs of cardiovascular compromise. Chest pain, especially pain that radiates to the neck, jaw, or arm, or that is accompanied by shortness of breath, headache, dizziness, weakness, or vomiting, must be reported immediately. Other reportable signs and symptoms include cold, blue, or painful feet or hands, blood pressure below 100 over 60 or above 140 over 90, pulse rate below 60 or above 100, or any time you are unable to palpate a pulse or auscultate a blood pressure. The word palpate a pulse means you're feeling for the pulse. When we're palpating the radial pulse on each other, we can feel a pulse and we can count the beats of the heart. Auscultating a blood pressure means listening for the blood pressure. When you're listening with your stethoscope, you're listening to hear the blood pressure. The top number is the beating of the heart when it's beating and pumping. The bottom or the faster systolic number. The diastolic number on the bottom is when your heart is at rest, and that's when the heart is done pumping out the blood to the system. So we listen to the blood pressure when we're auscultating it. Okay? Um, knowing the vital signs is important for the circulatory system. You don't have to know the chambers of the heart, how the blood pumps through the heart, how the blood goes back to the lungs and back to the heart and back to the body. You need to know the normal and the abnormal vital signs. So if you have a heart rate less than 50 or a heart rate greater than 100, then you may have a problem with your circulatory system. If someone's hands and feet are starting to turn blue or they're really cold, you may have a problem with the circulatory system. Um, if you can't get a blood pressure, you definitely have a problem with the circulatory system. If the machine says error, if you're using an automatic machine, you need to get a manual blood pressure. That's why we learn how to do manual blood pressures, because sometimes if someone's having an abnormal blood pressure or it's too low or too high, the machine's not going to read it. Uh, there is a very common disease called atrial fibrillation, where the heart is just quivering and it's not pumping effectively. And it's really hard for automatic machines to measure a blood pressure because they're not getting a distinctive push and relax. They're just getting a quivering. So you need to take that manual blood pressure, auscultate it, listen for it. 
Um, anything less, the abnormal, the low blood pressure is hypotension. So less than 90 over 60 needs to be reported. Hypertension, the blood pressure is too high. Greater than 140 over 90 needs to be reported to staff immediately. Our circulatory system is made up of different blood vessels like I talked about. We have um, the heart is the biggest muscle that's part of the circulatory system. Obviously, it's between your lungs. It's on the left-hand side of your chest. It is a muscle, so the more you work it, the bigger it gets. The only problem with that is that it is not a muscle that is good if it's bigger. It's, the, it's bad. If you have a big, huge muscle, muscle heart, it actually is not able to pump as efficiently, and you're considered to be in congestive heart failure. So if, it, if you're stretching your heart because your arteries and veins are really small and skinny and there's pressure building up into your heart, or your heart has to push more or pump more, and the muscles have to work more, the more those muscles work, the larger it gets, the less effective the heart gets. And then, just like every other muscle, when you don't use it, it turns to fat and flab and is just really ineffective. Um, like I said, you don't really have to know all of these different chambers of your heart. We just know that it's located on the left-hand side of your chest. Sometimes if you're taking a radial pulse, the nurse may be taking an apical pulse where they are listening or auscultating to the heart, listening for the heartbeat, while you're taking a radial pulse, and you're going to see the difference between what the heart is actually beating and how many beats are actually getting to the periphery or to the radial pulse where you're able to measure it. That can be a sign of blockages in your arteries. Okay. Four chambers, two atria, two ventricles, blood vessels, arteries carrying those oxygenated blood, capillaries are the tiny vessels that exchange the oxygen and carbon dioxide like we saw in the lungs. And then your veins are carrying your deoxygenated blood back to the lungs to get more oxygen. As we age, the muscle wall thickens. The heart has to work harder. It may beat a little bit faster. This is called tachycardia. Tachycardia is a heart rate more than 100. Okay? Blood vessels become more rigid. They become stiff. It makes it harder for the heart to pump through them. Your blood pressure starts getting higher. Hypertension, or HTN, is hypertension. A lot of elderly people get isolated systolic hypertension where their top number is very high. That systolic number is like 170, 180. And the bottom number, the diastolic number, is normal, 60, 80. Um, that's still considered hypertension. Okay. Sensors that regulate your blood pressure with position, we talked about orthostatic hypotension. So when they sit up, they may get a little bit dizzy. They're going to get changes in positioning that causes their blood, their um, body to feel some symptoms. They're not going to be able to just pop up out of the bed and get up and walk. They're going to get dizzy, lightheaded, have that orthostatic hypotension, and fall down. Their heart rate can decrease also. So some people, their heart rate increases. Some people, their heart rate decreases. This is why we need pacemakers. Sometimes people's, the firing mechanism or the electrical current in their heart isn't working as well as it used to. No symptoms unless it's really, really slow, like bradycardia, then they're going to be complaining of being dizzy more often, or they're going to have frequent falls for no reason, and they're going to have vertigo. Vertigo is the word, is the medical terminology for dizziness, okay? Vertigo is like when you get motion sickness or you get this spinning in your head or this spinning sensation. That could be because their heart rate is too low and they're having bradycardia. Some more abnormal symptoms of congestive heart failure or an ineffective pumping of the heart. The heart is pumping all this fluid, pumping all this blood, but when it gets larger, it gets less, less effective. Um, they're going to have some edema or swelling in their legs, especially their lower extremities. You're going to see their ankles, their calves, the tops of their feet starting to get big. When you push on that, it makes an indention called pitting edema. When you raise your finger off of it, then the pit is still there. That is bad. 
there's different layers of edema or different scale for edema. We grade it on scale one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus, pitting edema. Um, it's just like the tenting of the skin when we're pulling up on the skin to tell if we have enough fluid or if they're dehydrated. With edema, we can just see all of the extra fluid in the skin. They're also going to complain of shortness of breath. The same fluid that's coming into their subcutaneous layer of their skin is also coming around their lungs or around their heart or causing them some kind of shortness of breath. Poor color in your feet is poor circulation. Um, some weight gain or weight loss, congestive heart failure patients, sometimes they have a fluctuation in their weight more than five pounds in one day is a problem. If they've gained enough fluid to have five extra pounds, more than they were yesterday, then that's a medical emergency. Some congestive heart failure patients need to be weighed daily. We talked about weighing patients in the nursing home. Usually in the skilled nursing facilities, they're only weighed once a month. And that's for nutritional purposes. But if they have some kind of disease process going on with a congestive heart failure, they may have an order to weigh them once a week so that we can keep track of their fluid balance with how well they are doing with their medications with that. Or they may be daily weights because they're just newly diagnosed with this and we're trying to adjust their medication. So weight, weighing people is very important. We're gonna talk about that in the vital sign chapter, but make sure you're weighing people at the same time of day every day. Also making sure they go to the restroom and empty their bladder before you weigh them. So get rid of, getting rid of as many variables as possible so that we know we get an accurate measurement and accurate weight. You can weigh them with their shoes on. You can weigh them without their shoes on. You can weigh them with clothes on. You can weigh them without clothes on. Just as long as you're doing it consistently the same way every time so that we know that the variable in the weight isn't because of their clothes or their shoes or they had a full bladder or we weigh them at night instead of in the morning. Even if you weigh yourself, you may weigh a little bit less in the morning. As the day goes on, you gain some fluid and you may weigh a little bit more in the evening. But definitely a weight fluctuation of more than five pounds in one day needs to be reported to the nurse immediately. Complaints of chest pain or chest pressure or indigestion. Sometimes people are having a heart attack and they just say, oh, I'm having indigestion. If they haven't eaten anything recently and you know they haven't eaten and they say, oh, I just need a Tums or a Maalox or I'm just having some indigestion, you need to let the nurse know immediately because they could be having a heart attack. This is your congestive heart failure for your common illnesses and diseases, things that happen to patients, but when they have symptoms, we need to know about them. Congestive heart failure is CHF. Peripheral vascular disease is PVD. Peripheral vascular disease means that they're going to have poor circulation to their periphery or to their hands and their feet, things farthest from their heart. There could be blockages in their arteries that is causing the oxygen, oxygenated blood not to get to that particular area of their body. Coronary artery disease. Coronary arteries or arterial disease is when plaque builds up inside of your arteries. That narrows the walls of your arteries and it makes it harder for blood to flow through. Usually people who have high cholesterol wind up having coronary artery disease because the cholesterol is sticking to the walls of their artery, making it really narrow. A myocardial infarct, or an MI, so we talked about this in the medical emergencies chapter. If someone is having an MI, they're going to complain of chest pain. They're going to complain of pain radiating down their arm, radiating up their neck, indigestion, shortness of breath. So anytime that happens, it's a stat reporting immediately. A cerebral vascular accident, this is also a vascular problem, but it's not affecting your heart. It's actually affecting your brain. So you still have blood vessels that go up to your brain. But if you have a blockage, maybe a piece of plaque broke off, a clotted blood, a blood clot is blocking it. For some reason, that artery is blocked. You're going to have a CVA or cerebral vascular accident, which is a stroke. The other name for stroke was the TIA or the transient ischemic attack. 
That's just a stroke that lasts for just a few seconds, dissolves itself, and then goes away. And talk about that more in the neurological section too. Your congestive heart failure, again, a lot of times these people are going to be on diuretics. We give them a diuretic to help them get extra fluid off of their body. Fluid we can see in their subcutaneous tissue, um, the pitting edema or the edema in their legs, but also fluid that's around their lungs or fluid around their heart. So if we're giving them congestive heart failure patients Lasix, it makes them pee a lot. We usually give it during the day, so they're going to be having to go to the bathroom constantly. So you're going to have to keep up with getting them up and down and up and down to the restroom. They also are going to may develop orthostatic hypotension because of too much fluid loss at one time. So make sure they're not getting dizzy. Make sure they're taking their time and dangling before they get up to go to the bathroom. But we have to be able to meet their needs when we give them these medications that make them urinate. You have to answer their call lights immediately. They're not going to be able to hold their urine for too long. When they got to go, they got to go. And they may have to go every hour until the medicine wears off or until they get a lot of fluid off of their body. Your early symptom of congestive heart failure is your fatigue. But as you get overloaded with all this fluid, you start swelling and getting the edema that we notice. Sometimes they even start swelling in their abdomen. Okay. Additionally, fluid accumulates in their lungs, causing a shortness of breath. Sometimes they awake at night. Sometimes they're gasping for air. These are the people that are going to be unable to sleep unless they are sitting up. Some of them sleep in recliners or they sleep in the Fowler's position. So this is where you're going to be sleeping in semi-fowlers or fowlers or fowlers position where the head of the bed is raised up at least 35 degrees at low fowlers. Um, or they're sleeping on several pillows or they're sleeping sitting up in a recliner. So don't lay them flat on their back because that's going to make it difficult for them to breathe. They're going to have dyspnea because of the fluid compressing on their lungs and making them not be able to breathe. Your peripheral vascular disease, your PVD, like I said, is poor circulation, narrowing of the vessels that bring the blood to the arms, the legs, anything in the vasculature. Sometimes their toes start to turn purple or blue or cyanotic and look like they're about to fall off. They get ulcers on their legs from not having good circulation. Diabetic people are more susceptible to this. And as they age, they get poor circulation and wounds don't heal as well. They may get these blisters on their skin that kind of blister up from poor circulation. Um, people with peripheral vascular disease sometimes will wear stockings or the TED hose or the compression hose that we learn how to put on to help improve their circulation. Okay. With those TED hose, make sure you're taking them off every eight hours. We only leave them on for eight hours, then take them off, check the skin condition, then put them back on. The most common um, symptom of this vascular disease is painful legs. It's called claudication, but sometimes when people are walking, when they walk, their legs hurt. And then when they sit back down, the legs feel a little bit better. If they sit down and elevate their legs, the swelling goes down, the pain goes away. But that is one of the major signs of vascular disease. It can happen in one or both legs. It doesn't have to happen unil or on both sides, it could just be one side, unilateral. Your coronary artery disease. Again, your arteries are carrying the good oxygenated blood to different parts of your body, but if you have the plaque that's building up from high cholesterol inside those arteries, it's making that artery narrowed where the oxygenated blood can't flow through it as easily. Symptoms of coronary artery disease. One of the biggest ones is chest pain or angina. Depending on how you pronounce, uh, pronounce it, where you live, just like pecan, pecan, angina, angina, whatever you want to call it. If a patient tells you to have an angina, angina, they're having chest pain and needs to be reported to the nurse immediately. It's also described as a chest discomfort, heaviness, tightness, pressure, aching, burning, numbness, fullness. If they tell you anything, it's squeezing, somebody's sitting on me, there's an elephant on my chest. It can be indigestion. It can be heartburn. Um, it's in their left shoulder. It's in their neck. It's in their arm. It's going up to the back of their jaw. Um, their back hurts. 
Any kind of pain, report to the nurse immediately, stat reporting. They could be having their MI or their heart attack. The blood flow to the vessels that oxygenate the heart is blocked off. This is when we're having a heart attack. When we have a heart attack, we usually get an EKG on them. If you're going to learn how to do EKGs, they will train you that on the job. 12 lead EKGs, you stick the electrodes on them in a certain area, press the machine button, and it spits out an EKG. The EKG reads the different chambers of the heart and how the um, electrical current is flowing through the heart. We can usually tell where a blockage is by the EKG, but you don't have to know how to interpret an EKG. The doctors are the ones that are going to interpret these EKGs and look at them. The biggest thing for CNAs is to make sure you get a good quality reading. When the person is laying there, tell them not to talk. Make sure that they're still and laying flat for at least five to ten minutes before you press the record button so that we can get a good reading on how their heart is doing. If you press the button and the squiggly lines are all over the page, not in a straight line going across each little section, you need to redo it. Okay, so this is what a normal EKG, well I mean not a normal one, but this is when somebody's having a heart attack, but this is what an EKG should look like. There is a baseline with a straight line across each of the different sections of the read. All right, here we are with our CVA. Cerebral vascular accident is your stroke or your TIA, your transient ischemic attack. Stroke is just more of a long-term thing, lasted longer than three hours, didn't resolve itself, or resolved after a longer period of time. TIA lasted a few minutes and then went away because the clot broke loose and came out on its own. Sometimes people have a sudden loss of consciousness. They have paralysis. We talked about the acronym for strokes. If you're having a stroke, the best thing to do is to act fast. Face is the F. We're going to ask them to smile. We're going to look at their face and see if it's symmetrical. Okay. If they smile and one side of the face is drooping, they may be having a stroke. Okay. When they're having a stroke, they should still be able to move their forehead. The forehead would still move, but the rest of their face may droop. Okay. Let's see. The next one is A. A stands in the FAST. The FAST acronym F stands for face. A stands for arms. So you're going to ask them to put their arms out in front of them. If one arm is drifting downward, so they can't keep both arms even with each other, they may be having a stroke on that, that one side of their body is unable to control their muscles. Okay. The S stands for speech. You're going to ask them to say something. And if they start talking to you and it's all slurred, then there may be something wrong. Or if they're having dysphagia or aphasia. Aphasia is difficulty putting thoughts into words or difficulty speaking altogether. If they're having aphasia and they're not saying the correct words or they think they're saying something but it's not coming out the right way, they could be having a stroke. And the T stands for time to call 911. So May is Stroke Awareness Month, and you may see some bulletin boards around that have um, the FAST written on it. And this is just the little, a little picture of the acronym to remember what FAST stands for. So strokes are preventable. The biggest cause of stroke is hypertension. But here you can see the FAST, the face, the arms, the speech, and time to call 911. We need to make sure we get these patients to the hospital within three hours of their stroke so they can get some medication or we can see what's going on and then hopefully they'll have fewer residual effects of the stroke if we can get it resolved quicker. When people have a stroke, they're actually losing brain cells. They're damaging their brain because of lack of oxygen to the cells in the brain. When the brain cells are damaged, they do not regenerate. So people can sometimes gain, um, regain functioning because other parts of their brain take over and do things for them that the part of the brain that was damaged used to do. 
but the quicker they get in for rehab, the quicker that their synapses form or new synapses form, and the better their outcome is going to be. So don't wait when you see someone having a stroke or stroke-like symptoms. Call 911. Get them to the emergency room as soon as possible. It's a medical emergency. All right. The next system we're going on to, your digestive system or your GI tract. Everybody's heard of a GI bug. I have a GI bug. I can't come to work because I'm vomiting, having diarrhea. My stomach's upset. The GI is your gastro. Gastro is stomach and intestinal, intestines, intestinal system. It provides our body with a continuous supply of nutrients and fluid. It helps remove waste products. We take food in. We use the nutrients out of it. We waste what we don't need. The next little video is a nice little diagram of what happens to the food. It goes in one end, through your esophagus, stomach, large intestines, and out your rectum. So this peristalsis is the natural movement of things through your digestive GI tract. If you are bedridden, your peristalsis is not as good. You have to be up and moving around and sitting upright and letting gravity help you to let the peristaltic waves move the food through your GI system. If people are having diarrhea, technically not until they have three watery stools is it called diarrhea. Three watery stools in one day is a medical emergency. We need to start making sure they're getting enough fluid and not getting dehydrated. Okay, so this is a nice little version of the digestive system. And digestion, food is changed by the organs into a soluble form to be absorbed by the body. Food in the mouth is mixed with saliva. Saliva begins to dissolve the food as the teeth grind and cut it. Food is forced back into the throat, pharynx, by the tongue. Food in the pharynx stimulates the swallowing reflex. The larynx is pulled upward to meet the epiglottis and seal off the trachea. Food goes from the pharynx to the esophagus. Food moves down the esophagus by peristalsis. The peristaltic wave reaches the esophageal sphincter and food enters the stomach. The unique muscular structure of the stomach breaks up the food into small pieces called chyme. Chyme exits through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum of the small intestine. The major portion of absorption and digestion occurs in the small intestine. The mucosa secrete enzymes that supplement the digestive enzymes of the pancreas and the liver. This completes the chemical process of digestion. The walls are covered with villi where nutrient absorption takes place. The structure of each villus contains a capillary and lacteal to pick up the digestive nutrients. The nutrients are now transported by the blood to all the cells of the body. The undigested food reaches the ileocecal valve and enters the large intestine or colon. The colon absorbs water, manufactures vitamins, produces mucus, and forms and expels feces. Mass peristalsis pushes the feces into the rectum, which stimulates the defecation reflux. Okay, so there we are again with the peristalsis, and then the feces or the stool. Defecation means having a bowel movement. Your digestive system is made up of all of these different organs that I just went through. Your mouth is going to chew and grind the food. Your teeth are important. That's why mouth care is very important for residents to do BID or twice a day. We need to make sure that their teeth are in good order so they can grind and chew their food. If they wear dentures, make sure their dentures are well fitting so that they can eat and chew. Um, some people just gum their food, but we need to, in that case, it may need to be softened or pureed. Your esophagus is the tube that's going to connect your mouth to your stomach, again with the choking and the Heimlich maneuver. If you start choking, it's because your epiglottis did not seal off your trachea, and the food went down your trachea instead of down your esophagus. Your stomach is where the food is going to mix with some digestive juices. There's also some intestinal enzymes that break down your food and extract some nutrients in your small intestine. So most of the nutrients are going to occur in the 20 feet of small intestine that we have. Your gallbladder stores the bile that helps digest fatty foods. 
a lot of people have had their gallbladder removed. So when they eat fatty foods, they don't have enough bile from their liver to break down the fats. And it makes their stool very fatty and very liquidy and very gooey. Um, your liver produces your bile. The pancreas produces your digestive enzymes, like your um, amylase and lipase and insulin. Insulin helps to break down sugars and digest sugars. Some diabetic people don't produce enough insulin, so the sugars aren't being digested well in the foods that they eat. Your large intestine absorbs a lot of fluid back from your foods and things that you're eating, reabsorbs this fluid into the body, and it's needed to help or it reabsorbs fluid to help you have your bowel movement. When you're moving waste through your rectum, it's called defecation. Your anus is the opening from the bottom of the rectum where the waste is going to come out or the bowel movement is coming out. As we age, food passes through our system a little bit more slowly. The peristalsis isn't so well. We're not as active. We're not getting up, going around. You get constipated. Okay. A lot of elderly people are worried about constipation. They tell you every day, I haven't had a bowel movement today. It's like the top priority about having a bowel movement every day. It is very important. They need to be drinking lots of water. They need to be getting lots of fiber and they need to get some exercise. So sometimes they can't eat as much food because they're all stopped up. Their stomach hurts. They're having indigestion because they're constipated. Um, as we age, we also have fewer digestive juices, digestive enzymes. A lot of times patients get more gas, more flatulence as you get older. And that's just because there's less digestive enzymes to digest some of your foods. It gets stuck in your small intestines or your large intestines and just causes more gas. Okay. Decrease in specific nutrients that are being absorbed. Sometimes people can't absorb iron as well. So they get anemic because they're not getting the iron out of their food as well as they used to. Abnormal systems. Abnormals in digestion, if they complain of loss of appetite, if they have decreased bowel movements, if they have increased bowel movements, if they have blood in their stool, you need to let us know. Any kind of blood, if it's um, bright red blood coming from their rectum in their stool, it could be hemorrhoids, but we still need to know it's bright red blood in their stool. Um, sometimes they wipe and say there is some blood on my tissue, then let the nurse know. If it is a black tarry stool, that's also a sign of a gastrointestinal bleed. It's an upper GI bleed, maybe something in their stomach, maybe an ulcer. Um, but if it's black and tarry, you need to let us know because that could also be blood in their stool. Foul odor in their stool. Of course, stool smells bad, but sometimes it just has the worse odor or foul, foul odor to it. If they're having excessive straining, they could be causing, because of constipation, they may need a stool softener or something to help them so that they don't have to strain so much. Excessive straining causes hemorrhoids, so we don't want them straining excessively to have bowel movement. If they're con uh, complaining of nausea or vomiting, that's a gastro stomach intestinal problem. It's not getting out of their stomach, just staying in, causing some problems, causing them to be nauseated or vomiting. Um, a swollen abdomen or a distended abdomen, we already talked about before, sometimes it looks like they're pregnant and they're not. Inconsistencies in their bowel movements. Um, any weight loss, excessive weight loss or weight gain. Some common illnesses and diseases, constipation. Bowel incontinence means that they are unable to know when they're having a bowel movement. They may just leak out um, bowel or stool and don't even know that they had a bowel movement. Incontinence. They're unable to control the sphincter that holds the bowel or the stool into their rectum. If they're having diarrhea, sometimes if they have C. diff, which is the most common gastrointestinal infection, we talked about in the infection control chapter, and increase the amount of gas or flatulence like I just talked about. This is a picture of getting a enema. Okay, this is a like a soap suds enema or a warm water enema. The bag is going to be hanging up with the tubing that we can clamp on and off. 
The tube goes directly into their anus, into their rectum, and fills this fluid of this um, colon up with water to help release the stools, moisten the stools to get it out of the body. Next system is your urinary system. So your urine comes out because your kidneys are filtering the blood, filtering toxins out of your body, and then coming out from your kidneys into your ureter, from your ureters into your bladder, and then out through your urethra. Functioning, eliminating all of these excess waste, and it also helps to um, absorb the right amount of salts and water that our body needs in our it's important that fluid intake and output be balanced. The resident will put out about 500 cc's or less a day, slightly less than he has taken in each day. An imbalance may be a sign of a more serious problem. Other signs and symptoms of urinary problems include abnormal appearance of urine, it may be dark, concentrated, red, or cloudy. Unusual material in urine, like blood, pus, or other particles. Difficulty in urinating. Complaints of pain, burning, urgency, frequency, or pain in lower back. Complaints of urinating frequently in small amounts. Sudden onset of incontinence. Edema of lower extremities. Respiratory distress, sudden weight loss or gain, and change in mental status. So, same thing with fecal incontinence, people can have urinary incontinence where they're going to the restroom and not even knowing it. So, some people just as they age are incontinent, but if someone is normally continent and then all of a sudden they're incontinent and wetting themselves, you need to let someone know. Okay. The urinary system, four major structures, the kidneys, you have a left kidney, a right kidney, you really only need one kidney to function, but it's better to have two. You have left and right ureters that carry the urine from the kidneys to the bladder. The bladder is the storage area where the urine is stored until we're ready to eliminate. Normally people can hold about 200 to 500 milliliters in their bladder and then they have the urge to have to pee. Um, if you hold your urine for too long, it could accumulate in your bladder and cause it to be extended or distended. So if your stomach is distended, you can sometimes feel the bladder is filled with urine, but there's a blockage somehow. Some men usually have benign prostatic hypertrophy where their prostate or hypoplasia, where their prostate gland is pushing up against their ureter and causing it to be blocked off where they can't empty their bladder completely. Okay. So your urethra carries the urine to the outside of the body, where at the outside of the body you have your urinary meatus. When we talk about doing Foley catheter care, we're holding the catheter right at the meatus so that we're not pulling it out of the bladder. So just make sure you know the anatomy of the body and when people say they have a kidney infection, it's worse than just having a bladder infection. If they have a urinary tract infection, that doesn't that means it could be anywhere in the urinary tract. Usually it's in the urethra, has it just at the bottom of the urinary tract, and then it goes up and travels. The bacteria starts at the bottom, near your meatus, your urethra, and then travels up into your bladder. It can travel up your ureters all the way up to your kidney and give you a kidney infection, which is more um, more lethal than just a regular bladder or urethral infection. As we age, there is a decrease in the size of our kidneys. The kidneys have a slower ability to filter blood, less effective at concentrating your urine. There is a decrease in the amount of the capacity that the bladder can hold before you need to go. So maybe over 200 milliliters and then you have to go to the bathroom. Usually people make about three, 30 milliliters or about an ounce of urine an hour. You may have to frequently more usually, more than usual urinate if your bladder capacity isn't able to hold so much urine. Decreased bladder muscle tone is also going to make you um, 
not be able to empty your bladder or leave residual urine in your bladder that makes you feel like you have to pee all the time. Decrease in hormones that regulate your fluid volume, which gives an increased risk of dehydration. So elderly people get dehydrated a lot faster. Uh, so dehydration is a medical emergency. We can tell from their urine if they're dehydrated. If they have very dark and concentrated yellow urine, they're dehydrated. Okay. Very small amounts of urine. If they're able to go the whole shift, eight hours, and not urinate, they're probably dehydrated. If they have not urinated on your shift, you need to let a nurse know immediately. If you have a Foley catheter and the urine is just pouring out, and you have to empty that Foley bag more than once per shift, you need to let the nurse know. That's a different kind of problem where their kidneys aren't functioning and they're just having too much diuresis or too much fluid coming out. But again, if we give them a diuretic because they're in congestive heart failure, they may have a lot of urine coming out all the time. Cloudy urine could mean an infection in the urine. Urine that smells a little bit different. Frequently urinating. Um, complaining of stinging or burning is called dysuria. So dysuria is painful urination. So if they complain about painful urination, dysuria, you need to let us know. Strong odor of their urine. Sometimes their urine smells fruity. We can tell if diabetic people are going into ketoacidosis because their urine is fruity smelling. Um, clear urine that looks just like water. That's when we know they're in a problem called SIADH where they're just diuresing out all the fluid in their body. They could get dehydrated very quickly. So any kind of abnormalities in urine, just let us know. Some common illnesses that people have, urinary tract infections. A lot of people have had a urinary tract infection. It happens. When we're wiping, you're supposed to be wiping from front to back. If you're wiping the wrong direction, you could be pulling stool up into the meatus and then going into your urethra, causing a urinary tract infection. Stool contains E. coli. E. coli is not supposed to be in your urinary tract. If it gets into your urinary tract, it causes a urinary tract infection. Urinary incontinence. Some people are incontinent. Some people aren't. Doesn't mean just because you're old, you're going to be incontinent. It is a medical necessity. We do need to know about people who are incontinent, especially if they are newly incontinent, like they weren't incontinent before, and now they're always wetting themselves. Stress incontinence. Sometimes this happens in younger people. After you've had a baby, the pelvic floor muscles aren't as strong. When you sneeze or cough, you just dribble a little bit. So that can happen to anybody. It's pretty common. Um, this is what a Foley catheter looks like. The Foley catheter has a bag that needs to be emptied at least once a shift, but this bag holds about 2,000 liters, milliliters. So that's like a two liter Coke bottle. You know, you don't need to pee that much in eight hours, an eight hour shift. This bag shouldn't be completely filled by the time you empty it. It needs to be emptied every shift. Your urinary retention is the inability to urinate. Sometimes we're always talking about the enlarged prostate with the male for BPH. This prostate right here will block off their urethra and make it so there's little room for the urine to actually come out of their bladder. So they feel like they're distended. They feel like they have to pee, but they can't pee because the urine can't come out. Sometimes they just, it eventually gets so much urine in their bladder that it causes pressure. It'll push a little bit down into their urethra and then they'll just dribble. Or men commonly complain about like inability to start their stream. Like they can't start peeing, but once they start peeing, then it does come out. So that hesitance, hesitancy in peeing, you need to report that to the nurse. Um, if you have a kidney stone, that's another kind of common illness or disease that happens. It is genetically related. Some people have it, some people don't. People have kidney stones. It causes flank pain or pain in their back or on the backside. It also causes groin pain or just like if they broke a hip, they may be complaining of groin pain and it could just be a kidney stone. But if they're complaining of any kind of pain, let us know. Next system, the nervous system. So here, the function of the nervous system is the communication system. 
We have a brain that sends signals down our spinal cord, out through our peripheral nervous system, and out to all the nerves in your body. It works with the sensory and the endocrine systems to direct all of your other bodily functions. So people who have spinal cord injuries, the brain is sending a signal down the spinal cord, but if the spinal cord is injured, it may not travel signals to the rest of the body. People with spinal cord injuries sometimes have loss of feeling in the periphery, sometimes have loss of movement because their muscles can't be triggered by the signals that need to move the body. Serious nervous system emergencies may be manifested by subtle to drastic changes in level of consciousness, orientation, awareness, or alertness. Your daily observations as a nursing assistant allow you to quickly note and report signs or symptoms related to the nervous system. Some of these signs and symptoms include increasing mental confusion, progressive lethargy, loss of sensation, and numbness or tingling, change in pupil size or unequal pupils, abnormal or involuntary motor function, incoordination, and loss of ability to move a body part. All right, so anytime you notice any of those nervous system problems, you're going to report them immediately to the nurse. Uh, three major parts of the nervous system. Obviously, our brain does all of our thinking, reasoning, and judgment. The cerebrum is the largest part of our brain. And we have a spinal cord. The spinal cord has different sections in it. The cervical spine is up near your neck. Thoracic spine is more in your chest area. Lumbar spine is the lower part of your back. And that's when people say they have low back pain. It's the lumbar vertebrae that are affected there. And then the sacrum, you have some sacral nerves that go down towards the bottom of your um, spine. Sometimes if people are having difficulty walking or sciatic pain, it's because those sacral nerves are being pinched. So the nerves control movement. They also control muscles. They control nerves. They, they control how the sensations in your body. They are protected by the vertebrae of that spinal column, but they can get severed. These nerves are little fibers that extend from the col spinal column to all the parts of your body, carrying messages back and forth to your body, to your brain, to process sensations. When you touch something hot, you know it's hot because that sensation is sent to your brain from your spinal cord through your nerves. Um, as people age, these myelin sheaths, they are fat tissue that covers these nerves the myelin sheaths are what help speed the conduction of these nerve impulses. So if we lose this fatty tissue, this substance of the myelin sheath that's covering the nerves, then the nerves can get damaged or you have less nerve functioning. Some people have a feeling of pins and needles pricking at them. They call that neuropathy. Um, that's because the myelin sheaths are getting messed up. The nerves are overactive and they're just firing and triggering and they're just like a constant pins and needle pain. Some common illnesses for the nervous system. There are diseases that happen to people as they age. Not everybody is gonna have it, but a lot of people do develop these. Multiple sclerosis is a demyelination of the nerves. Um, Parkinson's disease is an over reaction of the nerves. The nerves are constantly firing and there's a constant movement. Alzheimer's disease, there's nerve damage there where it uh, affects your cognition and your memory. And then dementia. So we're going to talk about these in another chapter, but just because you have dementia doesn't mean, or just because you have Alzheimer's, that's not the only reason people have dementia. Okay, They're two separate diseases. Everybody with Alzheimer's disease has dementia, but not everybody with dementia has Alzheimer's disease. There are some reversible forms of dementia, but Alzheimer's is an irreversible form of dementia. Your sundowners, like we talked about already, people becoming more confused during the early evening, um, early evening hours where just our cognitive functioning is being 
compromised and they get a little bit more confused. That's called sundowner syndrome. All of these have to do with your nervous system. As we age, the slowing, slowing of the nerve impulses makes it a little bit longer for you to respond to an injury. It takes a little bit longer for you to respond to know that you're touching something hot. So your hand may get burned because you'll leave it on there for a long period of time before you finally realize you're touching something hot. A decreased blood flow to certain areas of the brain decreases short-term memory ability. People call these mini strokes. Um, but they lose brain cells, and then those lost brain cells take away some of their memory. Some people have an inability to form new short-term memories. Abnormal symptoms that we're going to report. We're going to report any loss of interest, any confusion, any isolation, or any increasing memory loss. Impatience, paralysis, reduced sensations, involuntary movements shakes or tremors, um, unsteady walking. Parkinson's disease patients walk with like a shuffling gait. It's like their feet are glued to the floor and they don't pick them up and walk like normal. They just shuffle their feet across the floor. So all of these signs are considered abnormal signs and symptoms of disease processes. Speech problems, just like we talked about with a stroke. If someone's trying to speak and they can't speak and they're having aphasia, we need to know. Your endocrine system. This is another system that uh, regulates hormones in your body. The endocrine system works closely with the nervous system and the digestive systems. It's all the reproductive system organs that cause your body to make its own hormones. So the biggest part of the endocrine system is the diabetes. People, your pancreas produces insulin. Insulin helps to break down sugars. People with diabetes have an inability to either produce insulin from their pancreas or an insulin sensitivity where they're not using insulin appropriately. So with your endocrine system, your pituitary gland is your largest gland. It secretes a lot of hormones. Your adrenal glands are on top of your kidneys to help regulate metabolism. Your pancreas is secreting your insulin, controlling the breakdown of your carbohydrates and regulating your sugars. Your thyroid and your parathyroid also help regulate metabolism, but they produce energy. Sometimes people say they're really tired all the time. It's because their thyroid gland isn't working effectively. Some people are really hyper all the time. It could be because their thyroid is overactive and producing too much thyroid hormone. Your gonads are your reproductive organs. They're still part of your endocrine system. They're secreting your hormones, your testosterone, your estrogen. So as we age, they control our sexual function, our ability to have children. When women go through menopause, they lose their ovaries' abilities to produce so much estrogen. Um, and then when men, men produce testosterone their whole lives, but as they age, they can have a decrease in the amount of testosterone they're producing. As we age, the glands slowly release less and less hormones, which could affect our health. The decrease in the insulin I already talked about is um, you're no longer going to be able to process your sugar. Sometimes you're going to have a, reduce, a reduction in your energy levels because you're not using your carbohydrates effectively. A dramatic decrease in the amount of hormones of your ovaries when you're in menopause. A decrease in the hormone in the testes um, for the testosterone for men slows their sexual desire. Also gives them less stamina. Um, abnormal signs and symptoms from the endocrine system that we need to report. If your patient is excessively thirsty, a lot of times that's given us an indication that they're having some problem with diabetes. So if they're constantly drinking, 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 and can't get enough fluid, we need to let, you need to let us know. A dramatic increase in their urine output. Again, if they're having clear urine that looks just like water, they could be having a problem with their hormones. An increase in the amount of food that they're eating. If they just keep eating and eating and eating and can never get that satiety or never get feel like they're full, they could be having a problem with their hormones. Complaining of feeling tired all the time. Complaining of feeling cold all the time. More than usual. Okay. 
any confusion, fatigue, fatigue is tiredness, weakness, any rapid or weak pulse, any irritable or slurred speech. So your diabetes, the most common illness, like I said, for your endocrine system is going to be your diabetes. Type 1 diabetic people cannot produce their own insulin. The majority of the time people are born type 1 diabetic. They don't know until later on in childhood, but their pancreas is not producing insulin. Type 2 diabetic people are producing insulin, but they have an insulin resistance, so they're not using the insulin appropriately. Glucose levels are checked by the nurse AC, which means before meals, and HS, which means hour of sleep. So we need to check their sugar level before they eat their meals. So if you're the one passing out the trays, make sure the nurse has already checked their sugar before you let the person start eating. If the person does not eat, it's important for you to let the nurse know that they did not eat their meal. We give them insulin based upon their sugar levels, but we also give them insulin anticipating the fact that they're going to eat something. If we give them insulin and they don't eat, their sugar is going to drop and they're going to be hypoglycemic and they may pass out. In your book, there's some signs and symptoms of hypo and hyperglycemia. You need to know these. Um, hypoglycemia is low blood sugar. Hypo means low, less than 60. If you have hypoglycemia, some causes of that is taking too much insulin, taking too much of your diabetic med, missing or omitting a meal, skipping a meal. If their meals are delayed longer than four to six hours, they need to be eating something at least every four to six hours. Eating not enough food. If they have a lot of exercise, then they need to eat more. If they have some vomiting, they can be dehydrating, they need to eat more. And if they're drinking alcohol, that can lower their blood sugar levels. So, signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, they may be hungry, they may be fatigued or weak, trembling, shaking, sweating. Sweating and diaphoresis is a big symptom that really kind of tells us if you touch their skin and it's moist and sticky and wet and diaphoretic, we usually assume that they are hypoglycemic. They can complain of headache, dizziness, rapid pulse rate, low blood pressure, um, fast and shallow, rapid respirations. If their movements become clumsy or weak or jerky, if they say that they're having tingling around their mouth, that they start complaining of um, confusion. If they have any vision changes, everything's starting to get blurry. And then again, if their skin is cold and clammy and diaphoretic and moist and wet, we need to know. Convulsions and unconsciousness. That can happen when they are hypoglycemic and their glucose is falling less than 60. They become unconscious and pass out. Okay. Hyperglycemia is when your sugar level is high. There are different levels of hyperglycemia, but ideally people's sugar should stay less than 120. If you are diabetic, your sugar is not always going to be less than 120. Um, but if your sugar, some people, the threshold for how high your sugar goes depends upon the person. Some people can have a sugar of 400 and still be awake and alert and talking. Some people can have a sugar of 200 and pass out. So signs and symptoms of DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis is when your sugar is going to be too high and they're going to become unconscious. And it's still a medical emergency, just as bad as their sugar being too low. But they have some of the same symptoms. They have weakness, drowsiness, excessive thirst, a dry mouth, excessive hunger. They may be frequently urinating, complaining of leg cramps. Their breath smells sweet. They have rapid respirations, a rapid pulse, a low blood pressure. The biggest thing for this is if their skin is dry. It's not going to be cold and clammy and moist and wet and diaphoretic. So if they're having a lot of symptoms and their skin is a little dry or normal, then we may think about that they have hyperglycemia as opposed to hypoglycemia. They're still going to have the blurred vision, the headache, the nausea, the vomiting. It still leads to convulsions and then eventually leads to a coma. Okay, so medical emergency there. 
Let us know if it's hypo or hyper or if your diabetic person hasn't eaten or doesn't eat. They also get snacks in between their meals. They get special therapeutic diets that we're going to talk about. The um, ADA, American Diabetes Association Diet. An ADA diet with so many calories and three snacks a day. So make sure they're having something to eat with a protein in it at least every four to six hours. Okay. Next common disease is uh, thyroid problems. So your thyroid gland runs our metabolism. It produces different hormones, but an enlarged thyroid gland is going to be hypoactive or it's not going to be producing hormones like it should. Um, an underactive thyroid is a hypothyroidism. So that means your thyroid gland may be enlarged, but it's not functioning like it should. So it's not producing the hormones that you need. If left untreated, it can cause a number of different health problems. Sometimes people get obesity from hypothyroidism. They get joint pain. They get infertility. They have heart diseases. Some people get extremely confused and combative because their thyroid is out of whack. If they have an overactive thyroid, it's called hyperthyroidism. This means they are producing too much thyroid um, in, um, hormone. Too much thyroid hormone is going to still sometimes cause fatigue at the end of the day, but they may have trouble sleeping or insomnia. They're going to be having rapid movements, rapid palpitations in their hands, irregular heartbeats. And they become irritable. They become easily upset. They have uh, when it's severe, they can suffer from shortness of breath and chest pain and muscle weakness. They develop a goiter, which is a lump on the outside of their neck. That goiter is a sign of overactive thyroid or too much thyroid hormone and hyperthyroidism. The more abnormalities in the male reproductive system as we age, it's a decrease in that testosterone, a decreased sexual response. We talked about the prostate gland enlarging with the BPH, causing mild urinary retention. Testicular mass decreases, which means they have a decreased sperm cell count. Men can still reproduce until they die, but as they age, they produce fewer sperm. The male system common diseases, prostate cancer, second leading cause of death in men, but is easily detected with a blood test. It is the most common type of cancer in men, but it is very slow growing, so we can check a PSA level and see if they're having any problems with their prostate. Um, it can be detected with that blood test, and then it's called benign prostatic hypertrophy. They also may have erectile dysfunction. They have pills for that. They also have pumps sometimes. Your female reproductive system, as we age, a decrease in hormones, a decrease in that estrogen that's produced by your ovaries is going to cause women to go into menopause. Usually by their early 50s, they'll be in menopause. But because we have less estrogen in our body, the vaginal wall starts to dry up some. There's less lubrication down there. It may be painful during sex. It may be painful to put a tampon in. You're not going to need a tampon anymore because you're not having a menstrual cycle. But it's still important to keep it healthy down there in your vaginal area. So some women use estrogen creams to keep it from atrophying and drying up. Some women use replens or over-the-counter lubricants daily just to keep it from getting agitated and irritated and dry in that area. Vaginal infections are a, are a huge common disease, big illness. Um, we need to make sure that we're reporting any kind of itching or scratching down there. Breast cancer, cervical cancer, uterine cancer is all still possible as we age. And then the HPV or human papillomavirus. Men and women can both get HPV. It causes problems in men and women. There is a vaccine now for it that your children get before they start their sexual lives, usually around 11 or 12 years old. They get two doses of HPV vaccination. So again, with your immunizations, you can immunize your children to prevent them from getting HPV, which is the only virus that's been associated with the coughing cancer. 
So HPV is a virus that is sexually transmitted that could cause cervical cancer or uterine cancer, or with men could cause prostate cancer and testicular cancers. So if you choose to get that immunization to break that chain of the link of infection, then they could be, there's hundreds of different strains of HPV, but those immunizations are for certain strains of HPV that are highly associated with cancers in the reproductive organs. So the next system as we age, the sensory system, the organs of the sensory system are your eyes, ears, nose, throat, and your skin again. So we're going to um, go through these little sensory system organs, things that happen to you commonly as you age, and then things that you need to report immediately as a problem. So as we age, our sight gives us knowledge about our surroundings. It's important for us to care for ourselves, but sometimes as we age, we start to lose our vision. Again, this is hereditary lifestyle choices. Sometimes it's avoidable, sometimes it's not. It happens to people at different rates, different stages. Some people can see, some people can't. The sclera is the white part of your eye. So when you're looking at someone's sclera, it usually looks white. If you look at someone's sclera and it's jaundice, that means it's yellow in color. Sometimes that gives an indication that they're having liver problems. So, the iris is the color of the part of the eye. The iris part of your eye is what um, regulates the amount of light that goes into your eyes. And then your pupil is inside the middle of that iris that expands and contracts and dilates and contracts that um, lets the light in and out of your eye. Your cornea is going to protect your iris. It's just the, a lining inside your, your iris that protects. Your retina is the back of your eye. The back of the eye sends the image to the brain for processing. So people can have corneal damage, which is if you get an, a foreign object in your eye and you rub it, you scratch your cornea, that could cause a problem. And then people get retinal damage. If you stare at the moon or the sun during a solar eclipse, they say you could get um, retinal damage. If you stare at bright lights for too long, you could get retinal damage. If you stare at computer screens for too long, it could damage the retina or the back part of the eye that's sending the processing to the brain so that we can see. Uh, the lens of your eye helps you to focus and sends light to your retina. And then the pupil is, again, that opening through which the light passes to get in and out of your eyes. So in dark situations, your pupils are dilated or wide open, so more light can come in. And then when you get in bright light, your pupil constricts and gets smaller to let less light in to that through the lens to your retina. As we age, the cornea flattens which decreases the ability to focus when we're reading. Um, the yellowing lens makes your greens and blues hard to see. Sometimes you get green, blue color blind. And then the orange and the red are easier colors to see. The lens has become more rigid, so that makes it um, seen clearly at greater distances, but you can't see clear close up. Your pupils are smaller, so less light is reaching your retina. It's harder to see in the dark. And then your retina is less efficient. It has a spatial discrimination decreases. You're not able to have like a depth perception like you used to. Things may look like they're right there next to you or close to you, or you try to pick it up and you can't quite reach it, or things are further away than you think they look. And then the iris becomes more rigid. They don't adjust as well to changes in light, so you're not able to focus well, or you're not able to drive well at night because there's too much light and too much glare. Abnormal signs and symptoms that you need to report to the nurse immediately. Discharge from the eye. Any kind of purulent means like mucusy looking, even if it's an excessive tears. Anything coming out of the eye as discharge needs to be reported immediately. Excessive watering, complaints of eye pain. If they're constantly bumping into things, like they've lost their depth perception, but they may have some other problem with their eye that we need to look into. 
Complaints of not being able to see well or focus clearly or blurring of their vision. If they wear glasses, you need to help them keep their glasses on at all times. Encourage them to wear their glasses. Encourage them to keep their glasses clean with a warm, wet washcloth. Okay. Some common illnesses. This is what cataracts looks like. Cataracts is a covering film on the outside of their lens. So the cataracts you may not always be able to see, but it is a film that covers their lens that prevents them from being able to see. Cataracts can cause blindness. Another cause of blindness is glaucoma. Glaucoma is actually pressure in the eyes. So people with glaucoma um, have eye drops that we put in to help decrease the pressure. But cataracts and glaucoma can both cause blindness for patients. All right, next sensory is your hearing. Your ears are obviously your largest part of your hearing. The ear lets us hear special structures inside the ear, help to maintain our balance as well. So our inner ear, sometimes if people are dizzy all the time, they may have some kind of middle ear infection or inner ear infection or it, and it puts them off balance or gets them having vertigo and dizziness. Okay. Some people have cochlear implants, which are these little parts right here where the hearing kind of takes place. And some people have hearing aids that are external that are gonna go into this outer ear in the ear canal or hang off the outer ear. Three areas of the ear, we have the outer, the inner, the middle, the outer ear, People have more cerumen or more earwax. It is in your outer ear. They're not supposed to stick Q-tips in there and pull it out because the Q-tip fibers, fibers from the cotton can get stuck in your eardrum or you can rupture their eardrum if you stick the Q-tip in too far. Cleaning out their ears with a, red, a rigid scooper okay, or pouring some peroxide in their ear and then letting them dump it out. We also clean out their ears with a solution called Debrox. It's over the counter, they can buy it, put a few drops in their ear, it keeps that cerumen or that earwax from building up in their ears too much. Um, but don't stick Q-tips in their ear, outer ear, down their ear canal and then rupture their eardrum. Their eardrum is a little tympanic membrane that vibrates, but it also keeps infection out from getting into their inner ear where there's some fluid that can get infected. And then these eustachian tubes are what carry fluid or drainage down out of your ears. This is an example of impacted cerumen or earwax. It does get hardened, uh, harden, hardens as we age, leads to hearing loss. So um, hearing structures as we age become more stiff. We lose the ability to hear high frequency sounds. That's called presbycosis. Um, soft wax production decreases, but it increases the amount of hard wax that gets stuck into your ears. Structures in your inner ear degenerate, which makes it harder for you to maintain your balance. Abnormal signs and symptoms. If someone is isolating themselves, if they're getting more angry, if they're tugging or pulling or scratching at their ear constantly, if you're noticing discharge from their ears, if they're yelling when they're talking, if they turn their TV and their radio up so loud that you can hear it across the hall, then let us know. The ringing in the ears is called tinnitus. Tinnitus is just a phenomenon that happens that we really can't do anything about. They complain, they hear this constant ringing, buzzing sound in their ear, tinnitus. Dizziness is vertigo. So dizziness and vertigo is like coming off of a roller coaster and your head is all spinny and dizzy and loopy and then it's going to result in frequent falls. So if you, if they complain about any of that, let us know. Your presbycosis is your hearing loss of high-pitched sounds. Presbycosis. Tinnitus again is the ringing in your ear. The last sense is about smell. So for your smell, as we age, people lose their ability to smell. They have a decreased ability to identify or detect odors, and this is a lot more common in men than in women. Okay? So they may not know something is burning because they can't smell it burning. They may not know they stink because they can't smell their own body odor anymore. Okay? 
and then taste as we age. It, we have a decreased ability in the way that we taste salts and sweets. The salty taste is on the tip of your tongue, and then salty, then sour, then bitter. Your patients will tell you everything tastes bitter because that's the only taste buds they have left on their tongue. Okay? The taste buds go from the tip along the side of your tongue to the back. They want their food more seasoned. They want more salt on things because they can't taste sweet and salty and sour anymore. Everything just tastes bitter. Um, and then touch. As we age, we have a decrease in the sensitivity in our hands. Again, when we're touching something, we may not know that it's hot. We may burn ourselves. Also, touching is being able to turn the page on a piece of paper because they can't feel the pages, the sensation of one page to be able to flip it or turn it. They have less dexterity in their hands because of their muscles, but they also have less feeling in their hands because the nerves aren't sending the sensations up their spinal column anymore. Okay. That is all for the anatomy and physiology chapter. Just be familiar with those normal things of aging and then some of the abnormal things that you need to report to the nurse stat or immediately.